All right, gentlemen, let's do our, our thing. Repeat after, well, I'm going I'm to just give you a little, a little something close. So basically, if what I say is wrong and you believe me, <clears throat> you don't lose a thing. But if what I say is right and you don't believe me, you have a chance to lose everything. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right. Let's do it loud and proud. You ready? Yeah. I cannot change anyone by direct action. I cannot change anyone by direct action. I can only change myself. I can only change myself. Others have a tendency to change in reaction to my change. Others have a tendency to change in reaction to my change. Amen. 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 Uh, <laughs> uh, let's not forget, gentlemen, we're on Zoom. I don't know how many millions of people are watching. <laughs> All three of them. But Worldwide, Patrick. Huh? Worldwide. We're live. All right. Uh, first of all, I want to just greet everybody uh, and all the alumni on Zoom tonight and want you to know that we're really glad you're here. We are getting ready to finish up a teaching that we started last week. And actually, this is a, a culmination of teachings, but this is the last one in the series on how to become men. <clears throat> and this teaching is right out of a book called Iron John by a gentleman by the name of Robert Bly. So this book was written in 1990. That's what, 30 years ago, right? Something like that? What are we in? 20? Yeah, 30 years ago. <clears throat> Thirty years ago, when this book was written, gentlemen, this man, Robert Bly, was on the, on the cutting edge of what we now know as the men's movement. Okay? This is when, back then, men were realizing that um, we weren't really acting like ourselves. We weren't the men of the 50s and 60s anymore. And for some of us, many of us, we realized we were missing something. We just didn't know what we were missing. Okay? And we didn't know what we were missing because nobody had wrote about it. Nobody had, had discussed it. Nobody had looked into it. And so this gentleman by the name of Robert Bly, and, his, and there's others. I'm just using his book uh, tonight to finish this up. But he was on the cutting edge amongst others. Some Christians, some not Christians. <coughs> to get us to start looking at ourselves and to try to understand what exactly it is we were, we were, we were no longer in touch with. Okay? So what I want to do for the sake of those on Zoom who didn't hear last, last week's teaching and some of you in here in the group tonight that didn't hear last week's teaching is just kind of give you the story in a nutshell, okay? So what happens is Hunter answers a challenge from the king. He goes into a part of the forest that men don't come back from. The hunter goes in with his dog, hand comes up from this lake, Boom, dog disappears, snatches the dog right out of, right out of, out off the ground, okay, into the water. <clears throat> the man who wants to try to find out what's going on, along with some other men, slowly drain the lake one bucket at a time. When they drain the lake and they finally get towards the bottom, what they find is a hairy wild man. The wild man is then taken to, tent, to the town castle in the courtyard and in prison. And now comes in our part or, or the part where the king's son, the prince, is playing with his golden ball. The ball rolls into the cage. Uh, let me backtrack here a minute. Uh, something I didn't tell you last week, but this golden ball is uh, symbolic of this, of this young boy's masculine energy, okay? 
<clears throat> when this all starts, this kid is about 11 years old, I believe it was. The story goes on all the way through him being 35 or so. <clears throat> and what that golden ball, what that mascul masculine energy really is, just to give you a, a, a simple thing, it's that feeling of youth when, when you and I uh, believed we could accomplish anything. You all remember that, that time in your life? Yes, when there sir. was a time you could climb the highest tree, the tallest mountain, uh, jump the, the lake, you, you know, put together with gum and tape ramps and somehow <laughs> thought you were going to take your bicycle over without crashing. I mean, those kind of things, you know. That's that, that's that masculine, masculine um, energy that the golden ball represents. And I want you to remember that, because that's important. At the end of the night here in this class, not on Zoom so much or, or on this tape, but or video, but on the end of the night in this class, uh, there will be uh, an award given out for those of you that have gone through this teaching. Okay? So, <clears throat> excuse me. So the prince, at this point, the king's son, playing with his golden ball, like I said, the ball rolls into the cage, which, again, is the feeling of masculine energy. And the prince finally, at, I believe, age 35, tries to make a deal with the hairy guy, the hairy man that, that has confiscated his ball. Now you got to understand again, the guy in the in, that's in prison, the hairy man, ne the wild man, never really confiscated the ball. The ball rolled into the cage and it took the kid forever, hear me now, it took the kid forever to get the nerve up or his mas to get his masculine energy back. <laughs> Okay. This is real important. I know it sounds goofy, and this is just a, uh, a, a mythical story, but it's a very important story for us. Because many of us have gone down this, this, uh, through this journey in life, whether you realize it or not, where we thought we could do anything, and then something happened, something took away our masculine energy, and now it's taken years, and some of you still don't have it back, but it's taken years to get that, that energy back again. Some of you, even after this teaching, <clears throat> won't really try to understand or, or, or get where I'm coming from with this and may even leave here tonight, even with your gift, without your masculine energy, simply because you haven't believed. Okay? Simply because you may, well, I'll get into it later. I'm not going to get into that. I'm not going to give the ending of my teaching now. Uh, obviously, for the sake of time, if it was just us, us guys here, then you know, I might get into it and backtrack everything. But let me go on. So the ball goes in there. The kid wants to finally make a deal. The hairy man says, fine, let's make a deal. Here's what I want. You want your ball. I got your ball. I want to be released from this cage. I'll give you your ball if you, go get, if you get me released. Understand what this deal means. This deal is the beginning of the boy's manhood. It's taken him 35 years, well not 35 years, but at age 35, from age 11, to face this hairy man and try to make a deal to get his masculine energy back. What it really means is, guys, is this, that at age 35, this young man is now finally willing to separate himself from his parents. Hear what I'm saying? Because you might want to listen. 
at age, because there's some of you in here that are a lot older than that, and you still haven't separated yourself from your parents. But at age 35, this boy is willing to separate himself from his parents just so that he can retrieve the ball, because he understands living under his parents' um, domain, thumb, however you want to call it, living with his parents in his parents' home, which happened to be a castle, but nevertheless, his parents' home, he had to go by their rules and their regulations, and there were things they would and would not let him do, and he had to abide by that because it was their house. But he continued to live there, and he gave up his masculinity, his masculine energy, simply for convenience. Now, I am going to venture to say that this teaching to some of you is going to hit so, it be so pinpointed, you're going to feel like a laser is barreling right through your, <coughs> your stomach. I can also tell you that if you hear what I'm saying, and, and, and not just blow this off, but hear what I'm saying, contemplate what I've been saying about this, this not just this teaching, but the whole series on manhood and how, how this all comes together, that some of you may have some character flaws and problems in your life because you've not separated yourself from your parents. <coughs> Now, I'm not saying you may, not be, you may be living with your parents. I'm saying somehow they are still ruling your life in some shape, form, or another. Don't get me wrong, and people on, on Zoom, please understand, I'm not putting parents down. I had two of them myself. They were pretty cool. I loved them. But guess what? I am teaching this because I realized at about 33 years old, even though I was married and had two kids at the time and was trying to forge my way into the ministry, that somehow, even though I didn't realize it, I was still under their thumb. I was still allowing myself to be ruled by them. Their rules. Dad, will you help me buy a car? Sure. What kind of car are you going to get? Well, I was thinking about this, this, or this. No, I think you should get this, this, and this. What am I going to tell him? No. He's putting up the money for the down payment. Dad, you know, we don't necessarily want to come over for Christmas. He would put the guilt trip on me. Why not? Your mother's expecting you. Are you going to disappoint your mother? God knows I don't want to disappoint my mom. So we went over anyway. And I already knew what was going to happen at Christmas. We are going to end up in an argument. It happened many Christmases as I became an adult. That we ended up in arguments. No matter how good or bad I was doing at the time. Because... I went into those Christmases, I went into those holidays resenting, not knowing I was resenting, but resenting the fact that they had some kind of control over me. And at that point in time, I didn't know how to break away from that or break myself free from that. And because of that, I felt like I was less of a man than I actually was. I basically lost my golden ball and at age 33 made the deal to separate from my parents. Maybe it was age 32. But nevertheless, somewhere in there I decided to get my golden ball back. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes trying to get your masculine energy back hurts like the dickens. because you don't know what to do with it now that you haven't had it for all those years. And you don't know how to react to it. Hear what I'm saying. So we're going we're gonna to look into 
uh, at first, uh, right now, we're going to look into, okay, who or what is this wild man? Because I've been talking about a wild man, Harry had the toe, snatching people out of the forest, blah, 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 living at the bottom of the lake. Doesn't make any difference how he did it. You know, that's you trying to figure things out that you shouldn't be figuring out. Just go with the flow here. But we got to understand, who is he? Is he, is he, is he a savage? Because that's what he sounds like. Doesn't he? Some savage, some animal. But really, no, he's not a savage because because a savage has no re has uh, uh, no regard for other people. So he's not some kind of human animal that has no conscience and no regard. This man has a regard, and in actuality, in his mind. He's saving these people, all these hunters and stuff that went into the woods. He's saving them. Now, of course, the, the, the story doesn't ever tell us what happened to all the hunters. See, and I'll be honest with you, I'm like a lot of y'all. I'm, I'm all about analytical. What about this? What about that? I'm a counselor at heart, so I'm trying to analyze this poor guy as he wrote this, this or didn't write the story, but just repeated the story in book form that he's heard many times over in, in in different places. <clears throat> and so my first thing is, okay, who's this savage? What is he all about? You know, what's he doing? Where did the, where'd the dog go? We never hear about the dog anymore. I'll be honest with you. Up until about 20 minutes ago, I'm still trying to find information out about this dog and what the dog represents. I don't know why. I guess because I'm an animal lover. I'm trying to figure out, okay, why did the, the, the dog, the dog disappears, never find the dog, Never says the dog, you know, when they found the hairy man, the dog was down there. We don't know. So evidently we don't need to know. <laughs> That's the way I'm looking at it right now. We don't need to know. What we do need to know is who this wild man is. And this wild man, if you think about it, this wild man, in, 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 uh, if you read the story, now I know I've told you the story, and I'll be honest with you, if, if you really have a chance to, to buy the book and, and read it, you should read it. It's pretty. It's not a very thick book. It's about maybe a hundred pages, 125 pages. Not that big, I don't think. I can't remember, but it's not that big. But it's it's a great book because it really gets. It really helps us to get into understand who we are and what we're about. And it's an easy read because it's a mythical story. So it's like sitting around, you know, the fire and, and somebody telling you this story as you're reading. It. So this wild man that, that we're hearing about, we know he's, we understand now that he's not a savage. We understand that it's not that he, and he's not a savage because unlike savages who have no regard for others, he really does have a regard for others. As a matter of fact, the wild man has been prepared to examine where it is the boy hurts. That's really what the wild man represents. What is it about this kid that's hurting so bad. What is it about this 11 year old who's now 35 and just now getting up the nerve to talk to someone who's been in a cage for the last 20 something years? It's not like he has to fear him. The guy can't get at him. All he had to do was ask for his ball back, but it took him 30, basically 35 years to cut this deal to get his masculinity back, to get his masculine energy back. And the wild man portrays how, how, uh, how we, we not just lose our masculinity, but there are, there are things put in place to prepare us to examine where, where it hurts. I'm going to be real honest with you, and I know and this is not, you know, like some kind of like you've lost your mind type of thing, Pastor Joe, which probably is true, but not in this case. I really believe many of you are here at Fresh Start, and this is your lake experience. I've just, or not I, but something has just snatched you out of whatever it is you were in and placed you here in this lake so that you can do a lot of things and one of them is to find out 
what has been been bothering you uh, or plaguing you all these years. Amen. Amen. So in reality, and I'll do autographs later, I'm the hairy wild man. <laughs> Honestly. So so understand the wild man's masculinity is it his the highest expression. I know we call him a wild man and the story calls him a wild man, but really if you think about it, this wild man, he's the guy that can be out in the forest and live. He's lived under the water or, or somehow survived under the water. He has saved and snatched and saved other human beings from this um, uh, dread of losing their masculinity and stuff. So he's the highest expression of of saving us. Okay, again, understand this is a secular book. I'm not taking away from God, Jesus Christ, or anything else. We've already covered that for the last two months here in this class. But hear what I'm saying. The savage is masculinity's lowest form. So the wild man is the highest form. The savage is his lowest form because the savage has no regard for human life, or any life. Where the wild man does, he's doing what he does, trying to save people in all reality, not destroying them. Now, we have a problem. Here's the problem. It's called civilized man. So here we are now, civilized man, and what our problem is, is that, yes, we're civilized, or what we call civilized. I think the year 2020 has shown us that there are some, some people that are acting more like animals than civil, is that civilized, but that's neither here nor there. I don't want to get off that that will be here till God knows when. And uh, you know, I, don't, I think the few people watching on Zoom probably want to go to bed. But what we got is civilized man. And, and civilized, here's what's, what's going on. We as civilized men are trying somehow to incorporate our wildness into a larger self. Does that make sense? In other words, here's what civilization says we're supposed to be, but really we're just looking for this one thing, our masculinity, our energy back. And so what we do is we try to take this, this little thing, and now that we have this big grown-up person, called a civilized man, we're trying to do things to get that masculine energy back. And so we incorporate or try to incorporate that wildness into a civilized nature. And I'm going to be real honest with you. We've seen some of that this summer. Where we've seen so-called civilized people trying to find their wild man and they did the wrong way through riots and 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 I'm not even going to call them protests because I have no problem with protest. I have a problem with rioting and looting, and that's what they did: breaking and smashing and doing all these. That was civilized man's way of trying to capture that masculinity, that masculine energy. And again, I can't get into all that because that's, that's, that's a whole other four-part series. But think about it. So we try to incorporate our wildness into a larger self. And that's what the prince was doing all those years while he was waiting or wanting to get his ball back. He was trying to incorporate getting that ball back, his masculine energy, in doing other things other ways and hoping that it would take uh, the same shape and form of what his ball represented as far as masculine energy. We have done the same thing, and I'm, 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 I keep saying that, and you know, you stick with me, I'll get to that, but we've done the same thing. And so, 
Think about this. So the boy goes into the forest with the wild man. <coughs> the boy's parents think he was abducted, obviously, because one minute he's there, they come back from wherever they were traveling, and now he's gone. Nobody knows where he is. Nobody knows where he went. Nobody can uh, give testimony to what happened, blah, 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 blah. He just disappeared. He, went with, he was with the wild man. Somehow the wild man got out. Civilized accounts say he was snatched. We know by reading the book that he wasn't snatched. He voluntarily went with the wild man. But that's the only... See, in civilized society, that's the only way to explain why somebody would want to leave all these comforts that our parents have given us. But if you really think about this, and, I, and, and this teaching is not biblical, but I'm just going to throw this out. Does not the Bible say that when we find that woman, that right woman, we are to cleave to her and break away from our parents, basically? Okay, so this is in some, in some way, shape, or form, this is biblical. I just have never taken the time to find out all the scripture. But it is biblical because the Bible tells us to do the same exact thing. In other words, find your manhood, man. You marry this woman, you're supposed to be taken care of her. You're supposed to be the man, the high priest. Find it. Find them. That's what this boy's trying to do. Now the fact is that what really happened was this boy had a profound awakening and because of that he wanted to pursue this masculine energy that he lost as a child, as a young man, into manhood. Okay? I don't know if any if they say it anymore, but it used to be back in my day, you know, the whole thing was, you know, by age thirty 30, 35, you're supposed to know what you what you want to do in life, have a job, have a career, uh, honestly, be married, two kids, you know, whatever it is. I mean, the whole thing was laid out for us growing up in my age, in my era, okay? I know that it doesn't go that way anymore, but understand it doesn't go that way anymore because most of us, not just us here in this room, not just men who have lost their masculine energy, but most of us and our parents have somehow changed all that. So there's no more, oh, leave home. Or, or As a matter of fact, I give you the, the, think about this, those of us in this room anyway, well, maybe even anybody watching, if your parents, because I know Pastor Tim shared his testimony last this Tuesday, if your parent, when your parents finally told you, I'm not bailing you out. No. Think, yeah, right? Think about how you felt. It wasn't the fact that you were going to be behind bars. It was the fact that you weren't going to be your mommy or daddy or both or one or the other was not going to come down, get the bail bondman, bail your butt out of jail one more time. They finally have had it. In reality, what they did was <coughs> force you to try to retrieve your golden ball, even though you didn't like it at the time. You might want to just think about that one for a while, okay? So, where was I? I don't even know where I was at this point. Oh, so this kid has this profound awakening of... of, of into manhood by going with this with this in. See, again, I, I, I've, I've shared with you that that new age men, and I'm not using that as a as a as a religion, just as a a type of person. Are this new age people we are, and you can call us, you know, there's metro guys and, and emo guys and, and all these labels they put on us and the way we dress and you know, back in my day it was rebels and punks and of course, punk didn't mean the same thing it means now, but you know, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, thank God. 
Might have been, who knows, never mind. <laughs> but we have to see something. So, so this New Age man, many of you, believe it or not, have become naive and soft. I, I sometimes hear your stories and how you were, you were out in the street running and gunning, and I think, holy smokes, I wish to God, if I wasn't a Christian right now, I would be taking serious advantage of some of these boys. Because you got no stinking clue. You think you know what the streets are like? Most of us have no clue what the streets are like. And I'm saying most of us, because I'm going to be honest with you, except for the fact that I worked in Brooklyn, so I kind of kind of experienced the streets from that point of view, but I always got on the train and went home to upper middle class Jewish America because that's where we live. So I always fle fled that, even though I learned some stuff, but I fled that. I was never part of that. I never had to fight to stay alive. I never had to, I never experienced riots other than being behind uh, closed doors and, 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 and window grates, so I didn't have to worry about if they were going to come in. And the fact that my dad was kind of influential, so they weren't going to come in anyway. But that's a whole other story. You see what I'm saying? So when I say we, I really mean we. We've, we became naive and soft. And, and what's happened is, is all these, this whole thing with drugs and psychological disorders. And the, please hear what I'm saying. It keeps us from being in touch with our dark side. Because people are afraid anymore when we get in touch with our dark side. And understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that you need to become some savage, but what I'm saying is that each of us has a dark side. Amen. And the more we can get in touch with that dark side and understand that dark side, the more we can let the light in. That's called balance, gentlemen. I need to understand that there's days when I have wacky, wacky thoughts. And that's just reality. I'm going to have those thoughts. I'm not going to act out on those thoughts, but I'm going to have them. And I'm in control enough to not tell many people about them because I don't want to be under psychotropics after I get out of certain institutions. You see what I'm saying? Because that's what they do with us, isn't it? We have these, these feelings, these these things going on, these thoughts going on, and, 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 and we don't know how to handle them, and then we get put into places where they say, we know how to handle them. Take this drug, 15 drug, whatever it is, three, or and we'll handle them. We'll make you into a zombie. Don't get me wrong, I'm not putting down psychological science and, and things like that. And some, sometimes we do have chemical imbalances, but for the most part, most of us have gotten into this predicament. It's like getting into the system, the judicial system. Once you're in, have you noticed it's extremely hard to get out of it? Because it's not designed for you to get out of it. It's designed for you to stay in it. The odds are against you. Unless you do something drastic. Guess what? Some of you tonight have made the choice to do something drastic. You're getting your life back and hoping that someday you'll be out of that system. If you do the right thing now, you'll be able to figure out how to handle it and they'll have no choice but to let you go. Okay, well, certain institutions are the same way. It profits them to keep you, and please understand this, doped up and mummified and in their institutions, so to speak, or at least in and out of their institutions. It profits them. I don't want to get into all that, but trust me when I say it profits them. Okay? In reality, what they're doing is they are taking away every last ounce of your dark side 
that may be available to you, or at least mummifying it, numbing it enough that you'll never be able to get in touch with it again. You know what that makes you? I'll tell you what it may, or what it doesn't make you. You are no longer a man at that point. You are because you don't know what your dark side is. You don't even know you have a dark side anymore. And the bottom line is, God created us both it, because He's perfect. So just like He created us with male and female genes, He created us that we have a, a, a light side, so to speak, and a dark side. Amen. Now, He created us so that the light side, for most of us, overrides the dark side. Unfortunately, some of us, as you know, <coughs> most, of them, most of us, through drug addiction or alcoholism, have allowed the dark side to take over. And you find yourself in situations that are just unbearable. Okay? You hear what I'm saying? So that's why it's so important to understand the concept of this whole, of this whole book. I don't even know where I, where I am anymore. Let me see if I can find it. Um, all right, okay, so, okay, like I said, so we need both sides to be balanced. And in our case, there needs to be a reawakening of that warrior in you, that, that, that warrior energy that we all have, but we've been made afraid to show it. Now, some of us have shown it, <coughs> excuse me, uh, maybe by joining the Army or the, the, uh, the armed services. Some of us have uh, joined, uh, uh, gotten in touch with it because uh, we're hunters and, and things like that and, you know, whatever. You know, some of us get really crazy and, you know, uh, alligator wrestling, <laughs> being in Florida, stuff like that, which I don't know, you know, that's borderline right there, whether you need to be in an institution or not. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? Um, and, 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 and in reality, and I'll, I, let, me, let me tell you a story. So my son joins the Army. He goes into the infantry against his mother and I wishes, okay? And he, and he basically, what he does at that point is he's getting, trying to get in touch with his dark side and his manhood, okay? So what we tell him to do, he does exactly the opposite. We told him to get into computers and whatever so he can be in some bunker, you know, millions, hundreds of miles away, press a button, Watch the thing and you know down the down the down the uh, chimney, blow people up. Whatever. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not. But you know what I'm saying. <clears throat> no. So what he did, that's what we want him to do because he'll be safe. You understand? That's the mother and father in us. My son will be safe. I understand the boy's about 23, 24 years old, but I want the boy to be my little Jeremiah, and I want him to be safe. The same way I tried to make him safe at nine years old, teaching him how to ride a bicycle, and ran I don't know how many miles along with him to catch the bike when it fell. <clears throat> okay? The same parents that with his elementary school, maybe being from here to the, to the next door building, that we could actually sit on and watch him ride to school, and he wanted to ride because he's nine years old and all the other kids rode and he wanted to ride and we walked him to school. I want to ride, Dad. And finally we gave in and said, okay, ride. But God knows I wanted to run beside him and make sure he was safe. God knows for I don't know how many days, and I don't even know if he knows this, I was peeking around the hedges as he was going down that street until he got into the school, into, until I could see him get into the school, or at least uh, at that point they, we didn't, they didn't have crossing guards, the actual police officers were the crossing guards, so to speak, and at least when he got near the police officer so I know he'd be safe, which that's a whole other story these days, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, not on my part, I still think, but it's you know, a whole other story. I personally think we should defund the media and give money to the police, Amen. but that's a whole, I don't even want to get into that right now. But you see what I'm saying? So, so that's the same person, that's the same, so what he does is instead of doing what we asked him to do in joining the army, which is, was hard enough for us to agree on, you know, 
He's going into the army. The Iraq war, the Iraqi war was, was going on, or getting ready to go on, or in the middle of it, I can't even remember. But it was, yeah, it was in, it was in the middle of it. it. was going on at the time. I want to be here in America, push a button, blow people up. You know what I'm saying? Nice and safe in a bunker somewhere, you know. Nobody can, I mean, that's, I'm going to be honest with you, that was, as a father, that's what I want for my son. But as a son, as a young man growing up, this boy, this young man, needed to get in touch with his dark side. And part of his dark side, part of our dark side is just that, a dark side. We need to be warriors. And he joins the infantry of all things. And my first reaction to him is, are you out of your stinking mind? Why the infantry? You know, stick yourself in a tank or something at least. Why the infantry? And yet that's what he did. And he lived with it. And we had to live with it. But I can tell you this. And this is no lie. My son is the most well-balanced human being that I know right now. And I really, truly believe, other than the fact that we brought him up to be a Christian, and that's stuck with him all along, other than that fact, I think it has to do with he understands his, his light side and his dark side. He understands what it was and what it was about and why he needed to go to war, so to speak. Okay, I'm not here to argue whether killing people is right or wrong. That's not either there. He needed. He needed. He's the same kid that needed to become a ranger and go through that school one time. He said, he said, I'm going to make it the first time because if I don't make it the first time, I'm never trying this again. And he made it. Why? Because it was nice and it was easy? No, because he got in touch with his wild side, his dark side. Same reason, same kid that never hardly was even in a plane decides he's going to become a paratrooper. Jumping out of planes. Are you out of your, you know, again, have you lost your stinking mind? Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to paratroop out of a plane into enemy territory? Where is the thinking here? As a parent. As a young man is. Man, this is exciting. <laughs> As a parent, who's who's putting your shoe together? Who's inspecting your shoe? Do you inspect? Oh no, somebody, uh, one of the other people put it together and folded it and stuff. How do you know they're not crushed out of them? How do you? You see what I'm saying? I don't even want to get there. That's a whole teaching in itself. But that's that's the end of that. But do you see what I'm getting at? He needed to do that. He needed to do that and get in touch with his dark side. So that he would be a well-balanced, mature man and father and Christian and husband. I didn't like it. His mother surely didn't like it. But that's what he needed, not what I needed. I did it my way. He did it his way. You see what I'm getting at? But that's, once we, we understand that, and once we get that in balance, that we have a light and dark side, and we can live with both of them in balance, then we can live without the drugs, the alcohol, the gangs, and all the other stuff that we get into when we're, when we're not balanced. Because that's where it goes. When we're not, when, 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 when we're not challenged correctly, then we're going to be challenged uh, uh, incorrectly. And the way we get challenged incorrectly is where gangs come in, teen gangs and stuff, where uh, guys are beating their wives and their kids, where there's feelings of shame for things you've done, trying to get in touch with that wild side or, or not being balanced in it. Because we've, we've, we've lost our fierceness in relationships. And we don't protect what is rightfully ours anymore.
true. I'm going to be honest with you guys, and, and I'm, you know, I, I may catch flack for it, but I don't care at this point anymore. We're growing up in an age and an era right now where that's what society is trying to do to us, is, is to make us Make us just go with the status quo. Make us just not fight for our stuff anymore. Where people who are threatened, and so they stand on their on their lawn with with loaded weapons because there is 30 or 40 or 50 people seriously pissed off at them for whatever reason. I guess because they own a home and are threatening them, and yet none of those people went to jail, but the two people that were protecting their home went to jail. That's, the, that's what society, society is saying, don't worry about the riots, it's only stuff. It's only stuff. Really? It's the stuff, it's my blood, my sweat, and my tears. Amen. That's the stuff that you're talking about. Amen. It's my life, it's my livelihood. That's the stuff you're talking about. It's not just stuff. It would be like somebody coming in here and saying, you know what? We've decided we're taking over this building. You will have to kill me before I let you take this building over. Just because you want the building. Ain't happening. I'll fight you tooth and nail. I'll fight you till I die. And then when I die, hopefully somebody else will fight in my place. You understand what I'm saying? But isn't that what it's like? It's like somebody coming when you were a kid and saying, I want that toy. And then they snatches it from you. And all you do is sit there and, oh, oh, he took my toy. I'll be honest with you, I did that one time. Not I did it, but some kid basically bullied me. And because my mother had me uh, so fearful... Uh, because I was always bigger than the other kids, so fearful of getting sued even back then. She said, don't ever lift your hands. Don't ever do nothing. Well, I came home crying one day, and my dad was in the, in the garage, with, and I came home, and I'm crying. He says, what's wrong with you? And I told him what was wrong with me, and I'm expecting him to hug me and console me and think, you know what he did? He got his 33-ounce Louisville slugger, put it in my hand. I'm only this big put it in my hand, said walk back those same four blocks and go beat the crap out of that kid. Hey, that's my dad. Sounds good with me. Let me get this. And I'm dragging this thing, you know. And I made it about three blocks and then my mother shows up in the middle of a neighborhood yelling and screaming her guts. Charles, Charles, what are you doing? Neighbors are out there mowing their grass. They all stop trying to see what's going on. I'm embarrassed as all get out. And on top of that, my dad just told me to go break this kid's head with this bat. And I'm ready to do it because that was my dad. He said to do it. I'm getting ready to do it. My mother's getting ready to do the other. And I was seriously a confused young man. Then she carts me back. Then they get in an argument. And then my father finally gives in and says, just do whatever your mother wants you to do. And then he took me aside a few days later and said, don't you ever come home here crying like that again. Amen. You stay and you fight. I don't care if you lose. At least you fought. Do you understand? That's the energy I'm talking about. I'm not, and I'm not, please, I'm not promoting fighting. But that's the warrior energy that I'm talking about. That's what warriors back in the day did, didn't they? I don't mean my day. I mean the real warriors. <coughs> And we had that taken away from us, and we've we've done it, a lot of it, through the drugs and the, and the and the disorders that people pin on us and have pinned on us. I mean, I remember growing up, everybody had ADD. You know, well, in me growing up, everybody was was stressed out, so everybody got prescribed Valium. Some of you don't even know what Valium is; it's so old. And then when my sons came up, the big thing was every, all the, everybody, if you're a little out of, out of control, ADD, give them dope. ADD, give them speed. ADD, give them this. ADD, give them that. Yeah. Control males. You was male yeah. males. 
And so they controlled us. Again, they controlled us and they took away. Yeah, maybe he, may, uh, you know, I'm going to tell you, my son wasn't, he was, he was like always moving and grooving. But so was I in my day. Nobody, nobody shoved, shoved drugs down my throat from school. They just beat me to death. <laughs> you know, they didn't ever, oh, poor boy's got AD. No, they, you're rebellious. Wham, 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 wham. And if they didn't do it, they'd call my father and make sure he did it. And he'd do it. You know. But you see what I'm saying? No, and, and so drugs and, and all the psychological disorders have kept us from being the men we want them, we need to be. I'm running out of serious time here. So we <laughs> yet we gotta get this warrior energy back. For instance, back in the day, way back in the day, male initiation ceremonies were in every culture and very popular. Every culture had some kind of male initiation that they did, some ceremony, where, where the boy, as a young, as a, as, a, as a, not a young boy, but an older boy, is finally taking away from the women who have managed his life to this point. They're, they, they're, they're held up with a bunch of older males for a while and taught how to be warriors taught how to hunt for their food, taught how to defend themselves, taught all the things that we, and I would imagine many of you younger guys in this room, have never, ever, ever had anybody teach you. And I'm, I'm just taking that for granted. That many of you have never had your father or your mother say, here, take this bat and go break his head. And I understand that maybe, maybe that wasn't the right thing to do, but it was the warrior thing to do. <laughs> I just got a beating from a kid half my age. And my dad wanted to somehow restore my dignity, so he gave me a weapon so I could restore it. And then my mother took it away. Not just, not just my manhood, but the bat. And embarrassed the crap out of me in the middle of the neighborhood. You see what I'm saying? Now you say, well, I don't understand. What's the big deal? The big deal to that is, then I grew up and I felt like everybody that ever embarrassed me, everybody that I even thought was looking at me wrong or making fun of me, how did I figure out how to fix this since I hated what my mother did and the embarrassment she put me in, I did exactly opposite of what my mother wanted. So I would beat people to a pole. I mean, my friends would have to grab me off of guys because that's the kind of person I was. I mean, I would just, I just, I, and I understand, I'm not, I'm not bragging. I would seriously, like, black out and continue to beat them even after they're, they're just, they're a mess. Screaming for mercy, whatever, it doesn't matter. I just, I beat, I, because it had nothing to do with them. It had to do with me not feeling any more of that that uh, 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 energy that I lost as a boy. That day my mother stopped me from doing what I needed to do. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> and so, so what has happened is, is that modern society, because I could tell on your faces when I said about initiations, Modern society has done away with, with just about any thing that has to do with initiations. The only place you're really going to find initiations, I mean, I mean, you know, yeah, frat houses and stuff, but that's that's more just wanting to beat up on somebody than initiation. Is like in motorcycle gangs, gangs of any sort, they all still have initiations. You have to make your bones or whatever. I'm not saying however they do it is right, but there's ways to. They still have initiations. Where you you go with with older gang members and and you you are taught how to be a gang member and what's expected of you. I know that sounds holy moly, Pastor Joe. You've lost your mind. I understand it sounds crazy, but think about it. Isn't that really what's happening? And doesn't that happen in your jails? Those of you that have been in jail and in prison, don't you have initiation? Don't tell me you don't. You do. Because right off the riff, somebody is going to challenge you 
to see what you're made out of. Doesn't matter what group he's with or what gang he's with, they're going to challenge you to see what you're made of. And you have a choice at that point to tuck tail and run, so to speak, or to fight back. Not much of a choice because either way you're going to lose in that situation. But I will say this. I don't know anybody have tucked tail and run and come back and ever said, I've won the respect of, you know, whomever. I have heard guys that have gotten a living crap beat out of them and fought till they almost died, say, and after that was all over with, I gained the respect and they, they, they began to protect me and stuff like that. And again, don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not acknowledging that anything like, like that is right or wrong. I'm just saying it's reality. And that's what this book is all about. It's all about reality. And the problem comes where millions of men have grown up in an environment with just feminine energy. Okay. Now, say this for anybody that's listening that's a woman. I don't think that in itself is a problem. Because we need that feminine energy we have a feminine side. We need to understand, most of us, how to, be, how to have emotions and feelings and get in touch with That's the feminine energy I'm talking about. But we need the masculine energy as well. And honestly, in the 80s, and especially the 90s, most guys grew up in a one-parent family Mom taking care of the whole gig. You didn't get any of that. Maybe your dads didn't didn't have anything to do with you or were too busy or whatever the reason was. But the bottom line is, <coughs> you're the guys I'm talking to tonight. You're the people I'm talking to in Zoom because that has affected us. And we need to figure out how to get, get healed of that. Because that masculine influence is what helps us get ready to face the reality of life. Again, don't take this wrong. But for the most part, feminine energy says, everybody, let's not keep score. Everybody's a winner. Okay? I'm going to be honest with you. I have a six-year-old in soccer. Everybody, that's the thing. All the parents, oh, everybody's a winner. Let's not keep score. Jensen, come here a minute. <laughs> who won? We did, Pops. He knows exactly who won. Jensen, did you make any goals? Yep, Pops, I made three. He knows exactly. Maybe we as parents don't want to admit that, but some of these kids still understand that. And that's the masculine side. That's where the masculine energy comes in, where it prepares us for life. That not everybody is a winner. Not everybody gets what they want in life. And that's where our fathers and, and, and other father figures in our life, authority figures, have ho hopefully taught us that. And if they haven't taught it to you, I hope to God, in this last month and a half or whatever it is, I've taught it to you. That no, I'm sorry, not everybody is a winner. Some people lose. Whether it's by their own choice, or by mistake, or by circumstances, but sometimes it doesn't always come out roses. And sometimes you've got to fight to be a winner. And sometimes you've got to fight for what's rightfully yours. And I don't mean literally fight, I mean fight. Amen. So in conclusion, the final word here is this. This story has been told around a lot of campfires. I don't even know how many. It's been like some kind of uncollected inheritance. You know, you get those, oh, we found money for you. All you have to do is pay us $100, and we will tell you how much it is. And you paid them $100, and they say, oh, we found $25.33. Okay, but I just paid you $100. Don't I at least get the $100? No, you get $25.33. You see what I'm saying? Or you could do like my wife and I did, and they said, oh, just get in touch with us. You have uncollected funds. Not a problem, man. We can go to the site ourselves and figure this out. 
And she did. And they say we're getting money, some found money. But you see what I'm saying? But that's what it's like. It's like some some kind of uncollected inheritance story where, where, where uh, many of you at the end of this are going to know exactly what you've missed. And I'm going to give you a warning because there's going to be some of you, like I said earlier, that are going to laugh at this teaching and think, gee, Pastor Joe did a great job keeping us awake the last two Thursdays. <laughs> But I'm going to tell you this, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to look at you, if that's you, you're the exact guy that I'm doing this for. Because you don't have a clue of what you need to be healthy. Because you're taking this as some kind of joke instead of taking it as some kind of uh, uh, avenue to be able to Examine yourself and get open to what God wants for you. Because self-examination is what's needed to regain your masculinity. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right.